anybody in here wants to come into the viewing room, we're going to have a family prayer here in about two minutes.
Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this service for Cheryl Joy Orchard Holloway. Um, we had just been preceded by having the family prayer, and that was offered by her son, Scott Holloway. I'm Gary Wirtz. I'm a son-in-law. We'll begin by singing the opening hymn, number 293, Each Life That Touches Ours for Good. We'll be assisted in that with our chorister, Sarah Lemo, and our pianist, Jenna Ellis, both of which are granddaughters. The opening prayer then will be offered by Michael Brown, a nephew, and the life sketch will be offered by Christopher Wirtz, a grandson, our oldest son, who happens to be our landlord, who happens to be our bishop. And we'll go to that point. Our dear, kind, loving Heavenly Father, we humbly bow our heads at the beginning of this service for Cheryl. Beloved mother, friend, aunt, we are grateful for the opportunity to gather and to celebrate her life, to remember the fond events that have taken place and Father, as we are going to miss her, we ask that thou will comfort each of us to know that she is in a better place with her family, whom she missed greatly. We ask that thou will bless us, that we might understand, that we might have an assurance of her well-being and that our grief might be softened. 
Father, we ask that all bless those who will be presenting this day with music or with a spoken word. Ask that all bless them that they might be able to present their messages in a manner pleasing unto thee and unto our dear Cheryl. Once again, Father, we're grateful unto thee for all that thou hast provided to us for the knowledge of the atonement and for thy son and his eternal sacrifice. We open this service this day in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. My name is Christopher Wirtz, and Cheryl is my grandma. Though throughout my life we never referred to her as Grandma or Grandma Holloway, it was always Grandma Sherry. Still catches me off guard whenever I hear extended family refer to her as Cheryl. Cheryl Joey Orchard was born November 5th, 1936, to Lewis Earl and Iris Peck Orchard in Twin Falls, Idaho. Even when she was born, there was controversy surrounding her name. Shortly after Grandma Sherry was born, her mother sent her father to the courthouse to fill out all the legal paperwork. While both the parents agreed upon the name of Cheryl Joy, there wasn't clear understanding of the spelling. Lewis came back with a birth certificate that spelled Cheryl, S-H-E-R-R-E-L. Iris, in no uncertain terms, told him that was not the correct way to spell, uh, to spell her name and sent him back to the courthouse to get the name changed to C-H-E-R-Y-L, like it is now. Grandma Sherry said that it was her older sister, Mary Elva, who picked her name while she was away at teacher school. However, according to Grandma's brothers, she was almost named Trudy after the family cow. <laughs> Grandma Sherry grew up in Twin Falls as the youngest of 11 siblings. Though one of her siblings died before Grandma Sherry was born, her siblings had a great influence on her and helped raise her. Because her parents were 45 years old when they had grandma, she had a very different relationship with her parents than did her siblings. She remarked that her parents tried to make everything perfect for her and give her all the things she could, they couldn't give her siblings while they were younger, leading to the rest of the children to smile and tease her about how spoiled she was. She sometimes got to do special things with her father, like go with him on Mother's Day and her mom's birthday to pick out a gardenia corsage as a gift. It was always gardenias, which is why Grandma Sherry always loved gardenias. Growing up, she was involved in tap dancing and tumbling lessons, which she loved, with the cute sparkly costumes and the dancing and the music. The only thing she didn't like about it was her mom would make her perform at home whenever anyone came over. She also took piano lessons, played the flute, took elocution lessons, which I had no idea what elocution means, and apparently it means to learn how to talk all fancy-like, <laughs> and was involved in 4-H, where she participated in sewing, canning, and needlework, like making tablecloths and hand towels. She was involved in many activities and always surrounded by friends. When she was in fourth grade, Grandma Sherry came down with rheumatic fever and was in bed for four months. She missed a lot of time during a lot of school during that time, but her mother arranged for kids in her class to bring her books for her to read. Over the four months, they brought her a lot of comic books, a, st a stack which ended up as tall as the mattress. When she finally returned to school, she had missed a lot of math instruction from which she never caught up, but she could read really well. All of her math struggles followed her to high school. She took sophomore algebra as a senior because she hated math so much. Fortunately, her charisma and charm, and maybe the help of those elocution lessons, <laughs> saved the day. Her algebra teacher was the football coach, so he was gone a lot. He would put her in charge of class, which she could teach just fine. She just couldn't do the algebra herself. Her assistance in helping her teacher allowed her to get good enough marks to pass the math class. In addition to all of her fun activities and schooling, Grandma also worked. Her first official job outside her home she got when she was 13 years old. 
where she worked for an ice cream shop in Twin Falls, where she enjoyed the privileges of constantly, employee privileges of constantly being surrounded by sodas, sundaes, and homemade chocolates. She carried this sweet tooth with her throughout her life, which led her in her later years, if she didn't want to fix something to eat, sometimes she would simply have some fudge for breakfast or maybe a bowl of ice cream for dessert. Her senior year of high school, she worked at a drive-in restaurant from midnight to 8 a.m. After her shift, she would go home and then get ready for school. She worked throughout high school, not because she lacked for anything, but because she enjoyed working and staying busy. She graduated from high school in 1954 and attended BYU that fall, where she studied speech pathology for one year. Her family was very supportive of her schooling, and her parents and siblings paid enough tuition and expenses that she didn't have to work. Still, after that year of school, she felt she needed to take some time off to save up enough money to go back to school. She worked a variety of jobs and lived with different siblings in Washington and California, but ultimately didn't save any money or return to school. Instead, she moved back home to Twin Falls. In 1957, Grandma Sherry married Donald Scott Holloway in Twin Falls. They met while she was in high school and working at the ice cream shop. Together, they had four children, Iris Christine, Misty Dawn, Nina Fay, and Scott Elmer. They taught the, she taught them the skills she had acquired and honed growing up, such as cooking, canning, dehydrating, and generally being busy and industrious. Her sewing prowess particularly came in handy when sewing clothes for her children, including prom dresses for her three daughters. Grandpa Donald was in the Air Force, so for most of their marriage, they moved around a lot. Grandma was an Air Force wife, meaning she was responsible for hosting parties, entertaining families of her husband's co-workers, and being social. This also required her to be very organized and clean. Grandma was very neat and well-dressed, always kept her house very clean, and she was well known for being clean and having an organized and tidy house. This attribute was also known by her siblings, so much so that one time when my mom went to visit Aunt Margie, the first thing Aunt Margie said when my mom showed up at her door wasn't, hi, or welcome, or how was your drive? The first thing Aunt Margie said was, I don't keep house like your mom. <laughs> However, Grandma Sherry was also very compassionate, which sometimes trumped her desire for cleanliness. When the family raised lambs, sometimes they were weak or sickly lambs, called bummer lambs, that needed extra attention. Grandma would bring the lambs into the house to keep them warm and care for them. She would even make a bed of hay inside the house for the lambs to lie in, her sympathy and kindness overriding her need to keep the house clean. Grandma Sherry's compassion wasn't just limited to those bummer lambs. The small cottage behind their home was often occupied by a wayward teenage friend or displaced family member from her community who needed shelter. It was this example that taught her children that family was more than just the people already related to them. Another example of her kindness was feeding the homeless of Las Vegas. During the cold winter months, she would often make loaves of sandwiches and any other food she could gather to share with those who had none. Selfless service was one of, the endure, one of her enduring hallmarks. Throughout her life, Grandma kept up on many of the skills and attributes she developed early, earlier in her life, as well as developed new talents. She honed her cooking skills and learned how to make and decorate cakes, which she did for others as a hobby. Grandma Sherry loved, cro loved to crochet, and I remember her always working on one piece or another when I was young. She learned how to make ceramics, and I remember one Christmas as a child where she gave me a ceramic statue of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. She also learned how to paint. One of my favorite paintings, or my favorite painting of hers, was a, was a painting of an iris flower, which she gave to my mom, who made sure it was always displayed in a prominent position in our home. Grandma was proud of her Mormon pioneer heritage. She was a member of the DUP, the Daughters of the Utah Pioneers, just like her mother. When she would see the, her children or grandchildren enduring hard trials, she would often remind them that they came from good pioneer stock and that they too could do hard things. In my mind, Grandma Sherry left, left her family two great legacies, an example of the importance of education and a love of the Lord Jesus Christ. While Grandma finished high school as an average student and attended only one year of college, she understood the importance of being educated. This is evidenced by her desire to continually learn and develop new skills and knowledge. 
She also understood the benefit of having a formal education and being financially self-reliant. In 1986, 32 years after she started her education at BYU, she earned a bachelor's, degree, a bachelor's of science degree in speech pathology and audiology from Idaho State University. Two years later, at the age of 52, she earned a master's degree in audiology and began her career as an audiologist. She worked in the Provo area for a time and then moved to Las Vegas, where she worked for and had eventually retired from the VA. During her time in Las Vegas, she was able to develop her relationship with her sister, Margie, and her family, forming lasting friendships and memories. Grandma's love of lifelong learning served as an inspiration for her children, all four of which graduated from college. A number of her posterity have earned advanced degrees, have run their own business, or have been productive and industrial in their own right. Grandma Sherry loved the Lord and his gospel. Though the father of her children was not a religious man, she saw that her children were baptized into the church and fully supported them in their church activity. All four of her children served missions with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Following their example, after Grandma retired, she served a mission in New Zealand. She served in various church callings throughout her life, including serving as an ordinance worker in the Las Vegas Temple, the Provo Temple, and the Anchorage Temple. Grandma used the skills she acquired throughout her life in her church service. One example being that at the age of 79, she and her daughter Iris played a flute duet in sacrament meeting, a skill she first started to develop some 67 years earlier as a 12-year-old girl. In many ways, my life has been blessed because I inherited many of my skills and attributes from Grandma Sherry through my mom and my aunts and uncles. I've I've earned college degrees and served a mission. I've accepted opportunities to serve in and outside the church. And just maybe, I get my love of chocolate and ice cream from her too. I look forward to seeing her again someday and personally thank her, to personally thank her for the legacy she left me and my family. Like me, I'm sure my siblings and cousins also have special memories of Grandma Sherry that they will hold dear and sacred. We love you, Grandma Sherry, and we'll miss you until we meet again. We'll now be pleased to hear a musical number from Sharon Jensen, uh, her husband and her family. Um, families can be together forever. Sharon is a granddaughter. Then our speaker will be Scott Isaacson, a son-in-law. Then we will sing Mom's favorite hymn. Hymn number 292, O My Father. And then a grandson, Sten Isaacson, will offer the closing prayer.
In the New Testament, there is a very tender story of two sisters, Martha and Mary, and their brother, Lazarus. They were faithful followers of Jesus Christ, and he loved them very much. Lazarus became ill and was close to death. Mary and Martha knew that their Savior, Jesus Christ, had the power to heal Lazarus, and so they called for him and asked him to come. It took Jesus several days to arrive at Lazarus' home, but by the time that he arrived, Lazarus had died. But that is not the end of the story. As Jesus arrived at their house, he saw that Mary and Martha were weeping. He shared their grief with them. He wept with them, and he comforted them. Tenderly, Jesus said, Thy brother shall rise again. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Many of the family friends that were there with Martha and Mary wondered and questioned why Jesus had not come sooner to save his friend Lazarus from death. But Jesus was able to use that moment to teach them an important lesson, that he had the power to bring forth life from the tomb. Jesus went to the tomb where Lazarus' body lay, and he said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus, still wrapped in his burial clothes, came forth, and his family and friends ran to greet him. Lazarus was alive. But that is not the end of the story. Our wonderful mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, aunt, Cheryl, is and was a faithful follower of Jesus Christ, and he loved her very much. I have seen Cheryl tear up with joy as she expressed her love for her Savior, Jesus Christ, and when she felt his love for her. But Cheryl got sick and was very close to death. Her children and her grandchildren came to visit her and be with her and to pray with her and pray for her. Many called and talked with her by video. She smiled when she heard their voices. However, it was time for Cheryl to return to be with her, to be in her heavenly home and to be with God. Jesus now sends his love to us to comfort us to weep with us, and to mourn with us. We believe that Cheryl's spirit still exists and is now in a place where she can continue to grow and develop and become the person that she will eventually become. The spirits of all people, young and old, male and female, of all races, colors, and religions are taken home to that God who gave them life. Those that tried to be good and do good, as Cheryl did, are received into a state of happiness. I testify to you that at some future day, all of us, as Cheryl's family, as Cheryl's friends, we will get a chance to see dear Cheryl again. We may even hear Christ say to her, Cheryl, come forth. And she will be resurrected with a perfect body, as will we all. Each of us will stand before loving God who will embrace us and individually call us by name and welcome us home. We will feel his love even more then than we do now. And in that moment, we will shed tears, but not tears of sorrow, but tears of joy for the blessings that God has in store for each each one of us. I testify to you that while we miss Cheryl, the story is not over. This is an eternal story, a story of hope and future, a story of our love for Cheryl and her love for us, but even more important, the love of Christ for each one of us.
closing prayer will be offered by another grandson, Levi Isaacson. Our Father in heaven, we are so very grateful to celebrate the rebirth of Cheryl Joy Holloway, that now that she's in heaven, that she will be able to tell our other loved ones that the rest of her family is okay in heaven, or in, in earth, and that as we will surely miss her very much, we do appreciate the time we had to spend with her and we ask thee to watch over us in our travels that we will be safe and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. have everybody stand and if all of the pallbearers will come up and form two rows on both sides of the casket and then everybody else can follow us out to the coach. 